Hello. Hello, this is Adam Smith speaking. Yes, hello. Many, many congratulations on the award of the Nobel Prize. Uh, thank you so much. It's much appreciated. <laughs> um, how did the news actually reach you? <laughs> all a bit peculiar. I'm not sure I want to go into it all. No, I had a call from Petrona, who, who uh, received a message from the Swedish Academy, and she wasn't sure what it was about, but I think she guessed what it was about. <laughs> And yes. they, she wasn't allowed to uh, speak to them, and they tried to contact me, and then the phone went dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I, then I hung up, and then finally they called me back again to tell me about it. The news made it to you in the end, so that's the main <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, yep. It's yet again a nice um, demonstration of the interplay between theoretical and experimental physics. Um, your yes, discovery. Yes, that's true. Yes. Well, it was... I mean, what I did was basically in 1964, so we're going way back, um, in which it was, it was just a little while after the quasars had been observed mm. and people had found this very puzzling. Well, there was a paper in 19, uh, for, uh, 1939 by Oppenheimer and Snyder where they uh, discussed a theoretical model of a collapse of a dust cloud. And it was more or less the kind of uh, situation we, we, we would now refer to as collapse to a black hole. But the thing is, they had, first of all, dust. And dust, is, is def by definition, is something with no pressure, so there's nothing to stop it. And secondly, it was completely symmetrical, so everything fell in towards the center. And so since there was nothing to stop it, you got this singular point in the middle and actually a model which looked like a black hole, but n not many people believed it, yes. most particularly because of the symmetry. When the, the Russians, this, this were two Russians, Lifshitz and Kalatnikov, and they had written a paper which more or less said that in the general case you would not get singularities. I looked at the paper and I sort of thought that the way they were doing it wasn't terribly convincing, that, it, that uh, I, I didn't know whether to trust it. And so I started thinking about it on my own and thinking about this problem in a more geometrical way. I not really solving equations because then you, you know it's too complicated and not uh, making sort of sim simple assumptions about symmetry because that's, that's the point, you mustn't have that. So I, I produced arguments. There's a little bit of a story about the, how the idea came to me, actually. I don't know. Do you want a story like that? I'd love a story. Yes, please. At that time, I was, I was at uh, Birkbeck College and um, a friend of mine, Ivor Robinson, who's an Englishman, but he was working in Dallas, Texas at the time, and he was talking to me, I forget what it was. He, he, he was a very, he had a wonderful way with words. And so he was talking to me. And we got to this crossroad. And as we crossed the road, um, he stopped talking. As we were watching out for traffic, we got to the other side. And then he started talking again. And then when he left, I had this strange feeling of elation. And I couldn't quite figure out why I was feeling like that. So I went through all the things that happened to me during the day, you know, what I had for breakfast and goodness knows what. And finally it came to this point when I was crossing the street. And I realized that I had a certain idea. And this idea was the crucial characterization of when a collapse had reached a point of no return uh, without assuming any symmetry or anything like that. So this was what I called a trapped surface. And uh, this was the key thing. I said, I went back to my office and I sketched out a proof of the collapse theorem. The paper I wrote was uh, not that long afterwards, which went to Physical Review Letters, and it was published in uh, 1965, I think. And that was the paper. The, the crossroads, it's quite extraordinary, that, that, that image of you having the idea at the crossroads. Where precisely was this crossroads? <laughs> it's actually, I, I've been there again, and it's kind of ruined now because... The other end of the road is, is actually now a building. Somebody wanted to take a photo at that point, and it was a bit disappointing. <laughs> it's a walkway now. I think I don't think it's a proper road at the moment. It was a proper road at the time. I think the main road, I, I, I could identify it. If you pinpoint it, you'll have theoreticians in droves crossing it for inspiration. I think I'm perhaps I better keep it quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I've had no good idea going back there, so I can't say it works every time. Um. Amazing. How do you feel about being portrayed in things like the, the theory of everything in, 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 in film? It's strange, really, because it's not really me. I can't identify with the character um, who didn't seem like me at all. Hmm. The, 
the, the concepts we're talking about, black holes, they're um, hugely attractive in the sort of popular imagination. When you think about them, yes. do you visualise them? Well, it, or do you think it, in terms of yes, maths? Yes, no, it's certainly visualised. It was really, I had to have a very good idea of the geometry. That, that was crucial. Um, the space-time geometry, so it's not sort of three dimensions. You have to think of the whole four-dimensional space-time. And I get sort of used to thinking about four dimensions and using various tricks to get the picture properly. I do most of my thinking in visual terms. I'm a very visual thinker, rather than writing down equations. <laughs> uh, where were we? There was something I wanted to say. I think you asked me something which I didn't answer. Uh, no, the black holes have become more and more important, you see, um, also in ways that people don't normally appreciate. They are the basis of the second law of thermodynamics, which is a right, quite strange thing. I mean, I've always been puzzled by, you know, the second law. It tells you the entropy increases and therefore randomness increases and so on. Oh, now the other phone's going. Oh, dear. <laughs> I, 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 long to, I long to know the, uh, why they're the basis for the second law of thermodynamics. Though. Can you wait on just a second? Cause I yes, think of I course should... I can. Of course oh, it's can. my sister. Sorry, I'm two pho- on two phones at once, as you might guess. No, that was my sister calling me up. Um, where am I? Yes, um, they are absolutely fundamental to second law, yes. They are, in fact, you see, the entropy in the universe, or the randomness, if you like, increases with time. And you might ask where the greatest entropy is in the universe now. Well, by far, by an absolutely enormous factor, it's in black holes. And then where does it go? Well, Hawking tells us that in the remote future, these black holes will va- evaporate away which is, I, I certainly accept that. For the really biggest ones, you get absolutely enormous black holes, and that's where most of the entropy is. And these black holes eventually, after about, let's say, I think it's, a, according to Don Page, it's about a thousand Google years. A Google is 10 to the power 100. So 10 with 100 to the power, which is one with 100 zeros. Yes. But now you have to put 100 and 100 and, uh, 103, I think, is this figure. <laughs> so it's roughly that number of years before the biggest black holes all disappear. Now, according to me, and this is my cosmology scheme, which I have trouble getting persuading the cosmologists about, is that when the universe is rid of pretty well all its matter, it, in a certain sense, forgets how big it is. Now, that's a crazy idea. But you see, if you don't have any mass around, you don't have any way of scaling the size of the universe. And so it, in effect, becomes the Big Bang of the next eon, as I'm calling it, A-E-O-N. So according to my scheme, the universe as we currently understand it, which is from Big Bang, and then there's this inflationary phase, which I don't believe in, which is supposed to take place very, very early on. And then the universe has this most sedate expansion and then it has another exponential expansion and that's it according to me that's not it it morphs into the next big bang and our big bang was the morphing if you like of the previous exponential expansion of the previous eon now there would have been black holes in that previous eon those black holes would have evaporated away in hawking evaporation and that's where all the entropy would have gone into, or into the singularity, one both ways. And that concentrates itself into a single point in our cosmic microwave black sky. Now, we don't see that single point because nothing gets out until 380,000 years. This is all standard, cos- that part is all standard cosmology. 380,000 years, and then the point which was the black hole coming through or the remnants of it, if you like, or the radiation from it coming through, well, the black hole would have evaporated away, but it's all its energy comes through. And that comes through at one point, but it spreads out through the 380,000 years to a region in the sky about eight times the diameter of the moon. So the claim is that we see these regions of heat, heated, slightly warmed up, not all that slightly, significantly warmed up, regions in the sky about eight times the diameter of the moon. And in this paper, which I wrote with a couple of Polish colleagues, Christoph Meisner and Pavel Nirovsky, and a Korean-American uh, person who did the calculations, that's Daniel Ann, and the paper was published a couple of months ago in the 
monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, which is a respect, very respectable journal, and we claim that the signals we see, which we call the Hawking points, are the regions eight times the diameter of the moon, and the six most significant points we see them in both the W map satellite data and in the Planck, the more, the more recent Planck satellite data, in this, exactly the same places. So we believe there is a strong piece of evidence that they are actually there. And the uh, confidence level that we give for this from the data is 99.98% confidence that this is a real signal and not just random. So these are the remnants, if you like, of black holes in the eon prior to ours, and all the entropy pretty well in the black holes was squashed into those points, and it really gets lost at that point. How utterly extraordinary. And the, I, the, the this beautiful vision of the previous universe leaving its trace in our current universe, and then perhaps our universe leaving a trace in the next one. It's a beautiful yes. picture to paint. It sounds like you have another call coming. Is that right? No, no, it's Patricia doing my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the barber's chair, barber's chair at the moment at home. <laughs> oh, this is better, yes, yeah, sorry. All of us in, in our various lockdown states around the world have been in the barber's <laughs> yeah. chair at some point. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, I did it. Last time I did cut my own hair, it's quite true. But not, I didn't do as good a job as Patrona. No, she's an expert. It's been a very great pleasure to speak to you. Thank you, and um, uh, best of luck no, with it. It's a pleasure for me. Thank, with the rest thank of you. The day. Okay, speak again okay. soon. Thank you. Bye for now.